In some previous videos, I discussed the concept of hedging. And in this video, I want to go into a little more detail about the hedge ratio. Now, just to recap, hedging is a way to reduce risk by taking two positions. Those two positions could be in different markets or they could be with different types of securities. And the idea is that losses from one position will be offset by gains in another position. So it's not just in the financial markets. Individuals hedge all the time. For example, when they buy insurance. You know, in this case, when the asset loses value, for example, when the house burns down, the insurance policy kicks in and offsets some of those losses by paying the homeowner. You know, also the case of buying life insurance. When the person passes away and they're not earning, obviously they're not going to be earning any money anymore, the family gets the life insurance payout and that offsets some of the economic loss. Now, if you're going to hedge, for example, with the futures contract, you need to know the number of contracts to use, use to hedge. And this is what's known as the hedge ratio. And what determines the hedge ratio? Well, the size of the position is obviously going to be something that determines the size of the hedge ratio. For example, if we go back to our insurance example, someone that owns a $200,000 house isn't going to need as much homeowner's insurance as somebody who owns a million dollar house. It's a bigger position. The loss is going to be greater economically. So therefore you need a bigger position. Someone who makes more money is going to need more life insurance than someone who makes less money. Unless of course they're in the position where they make so much money or they have so much money that they don't need life insurance at all. Bill Gates doesn't need life insurance. His family is not going to be in a bad financial position should Bill pass away. Another factor that determines the hedge ratio is the relative sensitivity of the spot in the futures contract. So in the case of doing it with futures contracts, if one, if the futures contract is more sensitive to, to a change in something than the spot contract, then you're going to have to adjust the number of contracts. And you also have to consider the risk you actually want to reduce. So, for example, if we look at the profit from hedging, so profit is going to be equal to the change in the spot positions, is actually the change in, in profit, is going to be the change in spot position plus the change in the futures contract times the number of futures contracts you have. And the number of futures contracts you have, if it's positive, it means you buy the futures. If it's negative, it means you sell the futures. And that's going to depend on what position you have in the spot market, whether you own the position, you're long, you have a long position, or whether you will be buying that asset, in which case you have a short position. Now, in this case, if we want the profit to be zero or the change in profit to be zero, we can set profit equal to zero and we can just solve for the hedge ratio NF. And we see here that it's minus the change in the spot divided by the change in the futures contract. So the bigger this position is, the more contracts we're going to need. Now this assumes that we have a, a short hedge. So we're going to sell those futures contracts. Now another type of hedging we can do is a minimum variance hedge. That is, we want to minimize the variance of the profits. And so if we took that equation that I showed you before and we looked at the variance of the profits, it would be the variance of the spot plus the variance of the futures times the hedge ratio squared plus two times the covariance between the spot and the futures times the futures, uh, times the number of uh, contracts. 
And if we take, if we differentiate with respect to NF, that is the number of contracts we want to use, and set it equal to zero. So what do we want to do? We want to minimize the value of this function. And when you minimize something or maximize something, you take the derivative, set it equal to zero. That'll give you a max or a min. I'm not going to check the second order conditions here to show you that this is a min, not a max. But what do we get? If you do that, you get minus the covariance between the spot and the futures divided by the variance of the futures. You can also rewrite it. I see it commonly rewritten this way. The correlation coefficient between the spot and the futures times the standard deviation of the spot divided by the standard deviation of the futures. So this is another way to write it. And you can do that because the covariance between these is the correlation times the covariance of the spot times the covariance of the futures. And if you did that, this squared term would cancel out. So you have one, uh, you just have the standard deviation here instead of the variance. And the standard deviation of the spot would be here. So you get exactly the same thing. Notice that this is similar to the value of beta in a regression. So the hedge ratio can be estimated by running the following regression. You can regress the change in the spot against the change in the futures. And minus that this uh, slope coefficient, or negative b here, is going to be an estimate of our hedge ratio. Another type of hedge ratio we deal with is when we deal with interest rates. And we sometimes refer to this as a price sensitivity hedge ratio. And what we need to do is we may need to adjust how many contracts we use based on these different interest rate sensitivities. Now, what this equation here says is that ds is the duration of the spot asset. df is the duration of the futures contract. And we know that the greater the duration, the more interest rate sensitive the asset is going to be. And then it's times the, the um, spot position times 1 plus the yield on the futures. And then down here it's the futures times 1 plus the yield on the spot. Now, let's say, for example, that the duration of the spot asset is 180 days, and the duration of the futures contract is only 90 days. That means that the spot position is going to be twice as sensitive to a change in interest rates as the futures contract. So you're going to need twice as many futures contracts in order to hedge this position. On the other hand, if this is the case that, if we have the case where the duration of the spot position is, let's say, 45 days, and the duration of the futures contract, say it's uh, Treasury bill futures, is 90 days, then you're going to have something that's half as sensitive to a change in interest rates as the futures contract. So you need half as many contracts to hedge. So again, you have to make that adjustment. For a stock index futures hedge, we have that same position we basically had before when we worked out um, that hedge ratio. And if you work this out for the next equation, what do we get? We get that the number of contracts, you're going to have your spot position divided by the size of the futures contract. So it depends on which contract you're using, times the beta. And the beta is, again, a measure of relative sensitivity here. So if you happen to have a beta equal to 2, then the spot position is twice as volatile as the futures position or is the futures contract, so you're going to need twice as many contracts in order to hedge properly. 
On the other hand, if you have a very uh, safe portfolio, one of things like utilities, it doesn't fluctuate much when the market goes up and down. Say you have a beta equal to 0.5. So that means it's only half as sensitive as the futures contract, which is probably based on the S&P 500. So you only need to use half as many contracts for the proper hedge. Finally, let me mention that when you're doing option pricing, what do you need to know? In order to price an option, options are priced somewhat differently than other types of commodities because when you look at a stock, we value it based on the present value of the future cash flows. But when we value a, an option, for example, a call option, we value it based on the principle of arbitrage. And so Black and Scholes, or if you use a binomial option pricing model, you set up this hedged portfolio. How do you do that? You need to know how much the options premium changes for a small change in the price of the stock. So you take the derivative of, for example, the uh, price of the call with respect to the change in the st stock price, and that's what we refer to as the options delta. And the delta is the hedge ratio. It indicates how many units of a particular option are necessary to mimic the returns of the underlying asset. Remember, you're taking opposite positions. So if you're losing money in the stock, you want to make money on your position, for example, in the call option. And this is the way that we hedge in uh, and value uh, call options and also put options. So that's a basic review of the concept of the hedge ratio. Remember, the hedge ratio is determined by the size of the position and any adjustment that needs to be made based on the sensitivities or the relative sensitivities of the spot and the futures positions.